tell me what this journey was. What, why did you pursue this particular area? That's a great question. Uh, because for probably more than 20 years uh, of my adult life in some form of activism and grassroots, uh, or as we some, some of us call it, emancipatory journalism, um, in all the, the black public political black political public spheres that I ended up in, regardless of the where they ended up on the political spectrum, I would hear a version of what I'm now calling uh, the myth of buying power, black buying power, regurgitated in one form or another. Uh, and certainly, as uh, uh, an Africana studies scholar and as a media scholar, you know, professionally just doing the research, I would come across versions of this myth. Uh, in the historiography uh, for years, and it just never seemed to match up with the reality that either we were living or that we were also getting uh, studied report report and data on in terms of the economic reality of Black people in this country and others and our relationship to the economy, et cetera, and so forth. So just over time to being in these meetings and hearing versions of people telling me, well, Black people have all this money, we're just not being, quote, unquote, financially literate. Uh, and we're misspending it, we're being irresponsible, and if we redirected that money, we could be doing a lot better uh, in, in, in this economic system. And again, it just never made any sense. So about 10 years ago, when I was at the time a columnist with Black Agenda Report, uh, I just started a, a series of uh, you know commentaries or columns uh, just looking into it. And the more I did research, the more clear it became that we have just been misunderstanding uh, in short form a marketing and advertising uh, concept that's never been meant to describe the actual economic condition of anybody, much less black people, Mm. but has been misinterpreted, misreported, and in some cases imposed intentionally to confuse uh, uh, and discourage certain patterns and and formations. Let's talk about that for a second. And, and, you know, we've been talking on these airwaves about the legitimacy of real journalism, and you called it emancipatory. That just just ran through me just now in such a powerful way. Emancipatory journalism, I love that. That was the spirit of Ida B. Wells, right? Emancipatory journalism. Yeah. So, I, I just so, have to quickly give the, the, the yes. credit it goes to Professor Hemant Shaw uh, at the time at Madison, Wisconsin, who, who he may still be there, a journalism professor who sort of coined the phrase uh, that I've adopted my entire, uh, again, academic career. But, but, but uh, And it just simply is what I, Ida and many others were doing. It was an idea that journalism has to be part and partial of anti-colonial liberatory political activity. So that's certainly what Period. she and others were doing for sure. But, but also a pr- pursuit of truth. Right. And I think, sure. you know, we're in we're in a very, uh, very complicated time where truth does not hold a whole lot of uh, sway with people like people are OK with being misinformed. There used to be an outrage around people lying to people or people telling people things that aren't true. And let me just say, you know, I've been parroting that same one point three to three trillion dollar number since I started the airways, because every year the Urban League puts out a report. The Urban League. puts out, So we can't trust our very institutions. So you just said there's a a reason why that number has been parroted out. Please explain, Dr. Ball. Well, uh, you know, I talk a little bit more about this in the book. There there are really uh, sort of sort of two parts uh, to the story of of buying power that I uh, track and trace. Uh, The initial starting in the late 19th century where the government and elite businesses were looking to find a way to uh, explain to an increasingly unhappy labor force that was raising more questions about why after the Civil War and after Reconstruction and all this industrialization and, and we're producing all of this, this product, uh, why aren't we making more money? And, and the elite were saying, well, how are we going to pay them, enough, pay them low enough to make enough to be rich? but have them be able to at least earn enough to buy the things that they're helping produce and to, and to quiet down uh, uh, potential social unrest. That's where the, 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 the phrase, as it's applied in this context, sort of originates. And then what we see by the 1950s after the Second World War and sort of the second phase that I'm talking about, is that's where really the black commercial press, uh, with John H. Johnson leading the way, sort of get involved. Uh, with playing with this myth and helping develop this myth in league with the, with the Chamber of Commerce and others in the corporate, the white corporate world, for lack of a better uh, you know, phrase, uh, to, to, to make the point essentially that in the post-Second World War era, 
this emerging black business class started to say, well, or media class started to say, well, we want to capture a good portion of the advertising revenue that's being spent by white corporations. We need some of that money. So part of the way to do that is to convince them that we have a population that, that reads our work and watches our, our, our programming or listens to our radio or reads our magazines that can actually buy the things that white corporations are selling. So there was sort of, and then white corporations and white America in general in the post-Second World uh, War era, this is where propaganda and, and, uh, and media become even more ingrained into the process of manipulation and management. Uh, and there were overt uh, discussions among the political elite uh, talking about how do we create consumers in the post-war era uh, and relate the concepts of citizen to consumer uh, and wed democracy to the idea of cap to the social uh, economic system of capitalism. So to do that, they want so they wanted to in, in part in, in expand their empire and in, in imperial desires and interests in the world. And, this, and again, in the moment where the United States became the dominant hegemon in the world. So so in part to do that, they wanted to to create the image that even the formerly enslaved could now rise up like anybody else in this wonderfully democratic capitalist society. So they were happy to help promote this mythology of black advance, economic advance as well, in part also to locally convince black people, you don't need to get involved with civil and human rights struggles. You don't have to get involved too much with politics. Just focus on your income and your jobs and buying things and, and getting your money right and participating in the economy. And you'll you'll uh, do just well, just just fine enough in this, in this society. So it's, it's in that moment that this relationship between the commercial presses and uh, the business elite starts to, to, to uh, um, develop into the moment where we find ourselves today, where, where as you point out, the Urban League, uh, the uh, NNPA, the National Newspapers Association, Publishers Association, the biggest publisher of black newspapers in the country, um, uh, you know, and, and so many others have, have uh, participated in literally developing the myth and then, of course, promoting it in, in their presses, uh, in part to satisfy the business interest of attracting more, uh, attracting more ad revenue. Uh, so we end up finding ourselves as an audience, as a consumers of this journalism, in a difficult situation where we, where we want honest and accurate discussion of our economic condition, but we're often having to go to commercial spaces that, almost by definition, can't really get into those, uh, uh, I think, the accurate and honest uh, discussions of what is, and what could be and how we might uh, get there. So, Professor, thank you so much for that. And I, I really appreciate the way that you broke that down. Uh, this is Laurie Daniel Favors, Afro State of Mind, chiming in. Um, I just wanted to ask, because it, with that being the myth, I think what a lot of us have, have done is similar to what Karen said. You know, we, we recite these numbers. We're proud about black spending power. And we're excited to know that the black community is spending one point trillion this and one point trillion that. And we do this much in that industry and we spend that much in the other industry. If that if it's the underlying uh, premise of those arguments, arguments and of those statements is a myth. What is the reality of what the black buying capacity is and how does that translate into any real shift in structural power, if it does, for black people? Well, I'll start with the end of your question. And my argument is that it doesn't have any effect on the structural relationship of black people or anyone else to the economy. Buying power as a concept is, a, is, is largely a marketing and advertising concept meant to help businesses address their ad revenue uh, to attract certain segments of the population to buy their product. But when we read the phrase buying power, we misunderstand the term power to mean what, what most people would think in terms of economic strength, that somehow this buying power somehow equates to real income or real wealth, neither of which is the case. And as the reports that, that, that produce all of these, uh, uh, that produce the myth more than any, they, to, to a certain extent, we have to be fair, they, in their um, reports, they explain that this is not about assessing any, any income or, or wealth of, of the black community. And they admit in their own documents, this is about uh, uh, matching businesses with corporations to get ad revenue together so people can, can you know, again, direct their ad revenue more. Are, are they being paid to do this report every year, Dr. Ball? Uh, I honestly, I can't speak to whatever business relationships exist. What I can speak to is what is reported and discussed openly, which is that, uh, for instance, 
when ABC News hired uh, Tom Joyner, it was reported, uh, and one of the executives of ABC News said, we hired Tom Joyner because he can help, if, in, 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 in essence, uh, he can help bring uh, the, the buying power of the black community to white corporations. That's why he was paid at the height of his career, I think, fourteen million dollars a year, uh, to to put these relationships together. So, and then and then similarly, as Joiner and the NNPA and 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 NAACP and other organ and Urban League and other organizations have 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 argued, the corporate world doesn't properly respect the buying power of the black community and should spend more of its ad revenue in black uh, owned media, black owned commercial media. So. Again, official, you know, what the, so can, the can they have it both ways? Are, I can't uh, say, but the, oh. but the express relationship or interest, business interests are that if 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 black commercial media produces this myth, they will attract more ad revenue from white corporations and increase their own revenue and budget. Uh, so there is, you know, they express that interest. The details of uh, how much gets paid and, or. or Right. Who gets paid what to do what, I, I, I don't know. Right, but, but the notion that a Tom Joyner can make that money because there's a perceived power, buying power, right, seems to be self-fulfilling because the money came in as a result of the perceived buying power. But you're saying that perceived buying power is not actually true. We're talking with Dr. Ball. He is the author of The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. So do we have power or don't we, Dr. Ball? So. The, the power I would describe we have is in political and social movement power. That's the real threat and power that I think a lot of uh, uh, propaganda is, is, is um, sent out to, to, to manage, uh, not just with black people, but with everybody. That's the, in fact, as others have put it, propaganda is the number one mechanism of, of communication between the elite and the rest of us, primarily to manage our public opinion so we don't raise certain questions, engage in certain political activity that would be threatening to structures of power and the, or, the, or, the current organization of society. Um, so, so buying power, we don't, you know, in terms of economic strength, we don't have it. And so, so one of the problems is with the $1.3 trillion myth, economically, it's more or less easy to dismiss when you just look at the actual data that shows that uh, collectively black people don't really even earn uh, more than 800 billion a year. Uh, so to be spending over a trillion uh, would mean that this would be be spending every penny earned and spending cr- on credit and going into debt, which most black households have. About black uh, households about six to seven thousand dollars in credit card debt, which would stand to reason because in order to keep up. Now again, see, this is actually so part of the problem is this is this is a subset of the broader economic reality where since the 1970s, uh, where production has gone steadily up real wages of working people has, has remained flat. So, uh, uh, so for all the discussion of $15 an hour for minimum wage, uh, most honest economists have already said that if we were to match where working people were just in the 1970s, the minimum wage would have to get well above $20 an hour just to get where we were in the 1970s. So to, to close the gap in terms of, in other words, going back to the origins of the buying power and uh, cost of living studies that produced all of this in, in the 19th century, how do you get people to buy the increased production and products if their wages are remaining flat? Well, to close that gap, you give credit uh, and hmm. you give loans to people for specific products that they can buy. So in other words, the buying power that's being discussed is the power that black people have to turn over whatever we earn to other businesses, other companies, other communities. That's what they mean by power. We have a power to take on certain debt to buy a car, maybe buy a house, or, 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 to, or to do maybe something other, uh, some other you know, rel- relatively lower level consumption, you know, uh, based activity in, in, the, in the society. But in terms of, of capturing actual wealth and, and even greater uh, uh, degrees of income, these are political issues that have to be taken up politically and socially. And that's why I think we, the power that we have there is constantly for decades and even, you know, even a century or more now been discouraged in favor of black capitalism, black entrepreneurialism, black business, uh, uh, which is, is uh, uh, unfortunately a trick bag that, that we can't ever get out of. Um, so aside from sitting over here and fanning myself and saying, oh, Lord, hallelujah, Jesus, what the hell is we going to do? Um, <laughs> because the idea that we spend one point two trillion dollars when collectively we only make about eight hundred billion dollars really does. And, and the last comment that you made to me speaks to the idea that 
the power of the black dollar is the power to enslave ourselves to debt laden products that we really don't even have the capacity to extrapolate ourselves from that sort of debt relationship. So I'm thinking about housing when during the, the 2008 recession, um, over almost half of black wealth, which was tied up in our houses, was eviscerated as a result of the foreclosure crisis. So to the extent that we had um, black dollars or black power or power tied to our dollars, that it could be so easily snapped out of our hands really speaks to the tenuous nature of that power. But having said that, and, you know, as I'm even thinking about Mercer Barandaran's book, um, Karen, which we talked about first last week, what should we be doing with our dollars that could lead us to a pathway where some semblance of power is even possible. Because from what you're saying, this entire idea of the black dollar is essentially a house built on sand. It really is. You know, it's mm-hmm. something, you know, I actually saw you make a point on a previous uh, uh, episode of this program that I thought was, was, was a brilliant way of, of describing the situation. I think to a certain extent you, you made, you, you said something to the effect that you had spent time or grown up in Germany and you had said that, that what we see in the current United States would be a, a sophisticated updating of, uh, 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 survive, of, of, of Hitler having survived uh, the Second World yeah. War, if I'm not misunderstanding. The way yeah. I interpreted that, where I vibe with that so much, is that, is that the propaganda that the Nazis studied uh, uh, to, to prepare Germany for the Holocaust and the entire apparatus of, of what the Nazis and others were trying to do in that country, much of it they learned and developed, you know, from the United States in the early studies in the United States, and then came back later to influence post-Second World War studies of propaganda and psychological warfare, all of which, is, is, again, to sort of address your question, has been, uh, uh, again, aligned against us uh, for the last 60 plus years to discourage, first of all, even these questions, much, much less than actual understanding how the economy works. So to, to sort of push back on something, uh, uh, Karen, you said a little bit earlier, I don't see the, the succumbing that many of us uh, often you know, fall into in terms of these mythologies as being something that is a, a fault of our own or the mistake. You know, this is really the, 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 the logical conclusion to the, to the just endless waves of propaganda uh, uh, displayed throughout the institutions in the society intentionally uh, to 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 have us reach these conclusions. Okay. Anyway, long I, I, answer to say, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I accept that yeah. that that okay. what you're saying, especially when you write in your book about how we represent one percent of the wealth in this country in 1863, and it's roughly the same today in 2020. Yeah. How is that? So, so it has to be by design because that makes no logical sense yeah. that we represent yeah. the same amount of wealth as we did right out of in, being in bondage. So the, and the only way to keep for, uh, uh, to to the, the really the only way to manage that reality without uh, you know overt force is through propaganda and managing public opinion. This is this is why so much effort and so much money and and time and why even to this day. The, the annual advertising budget uh, uh, is, is well over $400 billion. I mean, they're spending a lot of money to manipulate our consciousness all over the place. So I say all that to say that when, when you ask the question about what is it that we should be doing, I, I want to start by saying I don't know exactly what to do. I don't, I don't right, want well, to, well, you know, let's Because we're, but, what, what are we going to do about it type of uh, space here? 866801. Okay, so, good. All right, give me a but. Okay. But. <laughs> What I think we should be doing is whatever resources we have economically, I think we should, we should redistribute as best we can amongst each other to help each other. But with the idea that much like what the Black Panthers said about their projects and programs, that these are survival programs. These are not revolutionary programs. In other words, these are just to hold us over until we can get the space physically and intellectually to, to develop a revolution. So what I would say, you know, what we really need to be doing is, is developing our public and social, our, our political and social movement power. That's the real power we have. But we the live in a capitalist society, Dr. Ball. The, yeah. the book is The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. This is a society, and we even pointed out, built mm-hmm. on, on a system of bondage. They need us to be in bondage in order for this. this there, there's no American capitalism without black bondage. Hi. So, so but look, I, so look. On the one hand, if 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 
if I go maybe where I might want to go and we start talking about people like George Jackson, who I think really had the best analysis about what the situation is and what we need to do about it, uh, then, 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 um, Conversations okay, just, become, public conversations become more difficult. Yeah, yes, so, so but, they, but, they but, but listen, but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, because we, we, we have, okay. oh, we have to have these, I don't know where, where do we have these conversations if we don't have these conversations? So, because so unfortunately... Is, so, so this is why my, my public argument is in the book, and I think, and, and that is what I think, we, that, that I think we need to develop. See, capitalism, one of the myths that capitalism produces is that there, there is a separation between politics and economics. So the yeah. elite have understood from the beginning that they, they have captured the political system to make it work for themselves so that they can redistribute our wealth to themselves. We are all creating more than $20 trillion, at least before this COVID crisis, $20 trillion in the U.S. GDP every year. When we buy something, when we pay a bill, when we, whatever we're doing, when we buy a burger, buy, get gas, you know, we create this money. But the problem is the political apparatus has... has develop a public policy that redistributes that wealth to the top 400 families, the top one-tenth of 1%. So theoretically, my, it, it, you know, what I would argue is we need to develop a political movement that would capture the political apparatus that would then say, we're going to redistribute that wealth in such a way that we don't have to have... Oh, oh so you mean we should wealth. be voting and then we should have an agenda that we but enforce... We, but we should be, I think, see, but I think we should be voting and developing candidates in, 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 uh, along the lines of uh, what people like Malcolm X argued, that we should be developing our own candidates, our own platforms. We should be developing even our own political parties, our own blocks within political parties with a clear agenda, with some bright line issues that include what I'm arguing is every year $20 trillion in this country gets made and goes to 1% of the population. I don't know the exact way we need to write it out or whatever. We need to figure out how that money gets spread around in a way that, that we don't have to have any, any of the, uh, 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 you know, all these kinds of disagreements over who's suffering and who isn't. Then what I think needs to happen is we need to move offline, get into real political organizational spaces where we have in-person communication, off the record, no technology, everybody's studying political, you know, becoming politically educated, getting on the same page, and then in those spaces, all the other answers will come. In these spaces, okay. we need to, I think, need to have, okay. uh, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, in those spaces, there's always a Judas. I'm just, I'm just going to say that. Uh, there's always somebody that's going to say But if we were right. institutionalizing the knowledge that was coming through those spaces, everybody's got a Judas. If we institutionalize the existence of those spaces and the format for those conversations, if we created a way of thinking that was institutionalized, an analysis framework, if you will, then we would be able to have those conversations, whether Judas is there or not. We are teaching not just the points, but how to think about the point so that we can elevate our consciousness around it. And I want to just point out that everything Professor Bell said, now one of those points included do I have an elected official that inspires me to want to go and vote? <laughs> Ain't nothing inspirational. What nothing relying on you being inspired or feeling a sense of the Holy Ghost or feeling an anointed, charismatic preacher no. type of conversation. None of that has anything to do with the analysis that he just laid out. In six, fact, six, what I'm arguing go, is that, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Go I was ahead. just going to give out the number 866-801-TALK. Dr. Dr. Uh, Jared Ball is in the building. His book is called The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. Laurie Daniel Favors is here as well, Afro State of Mind. Go ahead, Dr. Ball. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that, that just to echo that point, uh, uh, part of my argument has often, you know, for a long time been that, that not only should we not be looking for to be inspired by somebody handed to us as a candidate, but we should be, again, developing our own. We yeah. should have an intimate sort of knowledge and awareness. I mean, back in 2000, I don't want to go back, you know, rehash too much old stuff, but back when, when Obama first you know, started to rise, one of the initial questions I asked was, as somebody who has, you know, been around black politics and grassroots organization for a long time and known a lot of people in those spaces, my question was, how come none of us know who this guy is? And those who do have a very different critique than what we're hearing about discussed uh, in, in mainstream media. Um, and my point simply was, and, and in fact, that's how he lost his first election to Bobby Rush in Chicago, that people kept saying, we, we just don't who know this it? guy. Right, who is and the point, And so even if he had been better, now I'm not even going to get into whether he was better or not than Bobby Rush or anybody else. The point was, and I think still should be, 
we need to be aware of who our candidates are long before they get to the point of running for president. We shouldn't be like, oh, wow, look at this guy. That's a pretty interesting person. Uh, no, we should be helping produce them from the beginning and the platform on, on, on which they're running. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's the only way I think the vote can have any real, you know, uh, or at least its maximum effect in this country. Right, For me, that to, speaks to ahead. the development of a pipeline, right? And we often talk, like, if you think about a pipeline in terms of a product like gas, gas does not exist in my neighborhood in bedford Stuyvesant. Ain't nobody got an oil rig in bedford Stuyvesant. What they do is they have an oil rig where the gas is. They create an artificial construct called a pipeline to move the gas from where the gas is to where the gas is needed. We need to be developing pipelines of leadership, not saying who is the leader? Who's got the best speaking capacity? Because every time I give a good speech, someone asks me, when am I running for office? And I'm like, sis, bruh, it takes a little bit more than just being able to string words together in a charismatic way to be an effective leader. Thank you so much, but that is not my path. We have to create pipelines of leadership, pipelines that are based, that are think tank supported, that are supported by not just people who are um, able to spin a good word and can put $20 words into $3 sentences, but pipelines based on study, like my elders who taught me, you need to be studying. You need to be a part of a group of people who are looking at what Ida B. Wells said, looking at what Garvey said, looking at what Sojourner said, not just because it's beautiful black history, but because there is intellectual genius in people who have dealt with some of the worst of what our people have had to deal with. You have to study politically so that you are clear about how to not make the same mistakes that three, four, five generations of people made because you are intellectually aware of the genius that has already come before us. And if you don't have study as a part of your fundamental political political education you could not just be a panther you could not just join the group you had to study you had there was six weeks ten weeks there were programs that you what, had to be a wasn't part it born of. out of out, out of an academic ability. wasn't it born out of an academic institution as well the panther philosophy Jesus. all right Lavery, I, I just had to get you a, Oh, don't you love her? Dr. J- Dr. Jared Balls, he's like, oh, Lord Jesus, I love her. All right, 860. Go ahead. Sorry, let me cut you off. Go ahead. No, Go ahead. no, please don't. Go ahead. No, I cut mean, me in, off. Fact, in fact, in 2007, to your point, someone heard me say, give, give a good speech and said, you should run for office. And I said, and I was fool enough to do it. And, oh. and that's why nobody heard about the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you lost, huh? Listen. I, you know, I ended up, it was within the Green Party, and at the time, I, I, I did. I, I would have lost, but I backed off to, to support Rosa Clemente and Cynthia McKinney at the time. Oh, okay. Um, well, that wasn't uh, a bad thing to do. that was a more do. important campaign. But, but my point is, you know, it was, I just echoed the sentiment there. It was foolish enough. To, it wasn't, it wasn't um, a well-thought-out uh, idea is the point. Oh, because it, it feels good, good, though, for people to want you to run for office. But what they're saying yeah, is, the save me. You might be able to support something that you, you know, I mean, I, you know, yes. They're saying, save me, awful, instead of saying, awful, yeah. Dr. Ball, they're saying, I need you to rescue me from this situation. Right. You're smart. You're going to rescue all of us. You're going to you're going to be Moses. You're going to part the Red Sea. You're going to be black right. Moses. Harry Tubman, lead us out of bondage. Instead of saying, what's our agenda? What are the things that I need to have happen in my community? What am I participating in right now in my community to make some things happen locally? And then what do I look for nationally in a candidate? Like we're not doing the study and the scholarship that Larry is talking about to even get a candidate that it can do the work when they get to Congress. And I just want to say that the children of Israel needed a Moses because they were enslaved. They needed a savior because they were still dealing with a slave reality and a slave mentality. They needed direct instruction from God through a particular person because they did not have a freedom mindset to be able to be society builders. They were enslaved with an enslaved mindset. So long as we are looking for someone to save us, we are demonstrating that we are still entrapped mentally. And this is not about, you know, oh, she said I'm a slave. Yes, we are still dealing with the trappings of an enslaved mentality when it comes to political community leadership. The one person who could be a leader within the slave population was the preacher. The one person that we look to now still to be a leader is the preacher or the elected official who we evaluate under the same rubric that we apply to our religious leadership. That is a problem. That is not how we built pyramids or created math and science. It was not that same mentality. I, I feel like we can go. No, we can talk to a blue in the face as uh, my man. Uh, no, who said that? We could talk to a blue in the face. Never mind. I, you know what? I'm. Uh, there's a quote about blue in the face. Anyway, 
I don't want to be blue in the face because that means we're lacking oxygen. I need us to, to solve this Rubik's Cube, and I need us to get to the promised land, all of us, all of us. Laurie Daniel Favors is here. Dr. Jared Ball is here. We're talking about uh, the myth, of, uh, myth and propaganda of, black, of the black buying power. But we're talking about something else that I'm, I'm not sure if we're capable of doing. So I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Laurie. I asked a question before we went to break, but I see you. No, we can do this. This is something that we can do. But we got to have a return to discipline that I think when we look back on what people were able to do in the 50s and the 60s when it, as it pertains to discipline study, discipline practice, the training. You know, I know the crack era, the heroin era really interrupted a lot of the transgenerational teachings, things that we should have gotten from that generation of elders were largely um, – uh, remained hidden from us because a lot of us grew up in families or in houses that were, were violated by the violence that ended the 60s and the 70s by the introduction of drugs into our community that really took out entire generations of people. But we, it's also within our DNA to be able to do this. Yes, slavery was a part of our DNA, and it's definitely a predominant part of our mindset right now, but it's not the only thing. There is hope for us. We just got to be disciplined, as disciplined as we are about standing in them damn lines for them Nikes, we got to be disciplined like that. Okay, Do- Dr. Ball, hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful in the sense that that whenever there is this level of oppression, there is also historically resistance. So I'm hopeful, just in sort of the science of history, uh, so to speak, that, that that there is going to be an uptick eventually of uh, political organization and movements that are going to make threatening changes to society. I just think it has to happen. I don't know that I'm seeing it developing right now. I'm a little more critical of what I'm seeing right now, so maybe this isn't the moment. Um, but I mentioned it before, like George Jackson said, that the, the job of the revolutionary and the non-revolutionary moment is to try to create space for it to occur. So one of the little ways I'm trying to contribute is just to say, listen, we have to get over this myth and several others before we can get to some serious conversations about how this thing works and what we can do about it. Uh, um, But I am hopeful. And 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 as as was just said, I know it's in us. I mean, it it is part, you know, as Kendrick, you know, it is part of the DNA. But part of the but part of the DNA of the enemy, so to speak, is to produce a level of pop- propaganda that's going to manipulate our public opinion to make us go to Nike and stand in that line and not be as interested in doing the same thing uh, in terms of pushing for for our collective uh, rights. Some of the frustration as well is that there are people who are uh, pretending to be revolutionary, but they really are about their own dollars and they're making money off of pushing the propaganda that they're pushing and no one's really calling them out on that right so if you are engaged in what you think is revolutionary behavior yet there's no actual way to get all of these wonderful things done you should know you're being duped right now for somebody else's financial gain and i don't know how we get to that because unfortunately unlike the 50s larry we have social media platforms and, and other platforms that allow for bots, Russian bots to, to usurp our, and derail our progress and, and our own people, the Judases that, that I was talking about, who are in our camp preaching something that sounds good. You know, our itchy little ears want to hear. It sounds good, but it's not really practical, nor does there, are there any teeth attached to it, but yet it makes you feel good inside. It's that, that, that moment that we were you were referring to, that preacher moment, Lorie. But I think that's why it's problematic to look to social media as the source of anything leading to revolutionary politics or to anything le- leading to liberationary politics. Um, that offline communication, that space of, of not needing to tweet out, live tweet your, your internal sessions, of not needing to Facebook live stream your, 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 your core dialogue, it is important that we recognize that when we had to, there was a time we had to go out to the woods and whisper these things. We still got to do that in a lot of ways. There was a time when while our white colleagues or, or counterparts were developing political clubs and thinking about the rules that would determine who could run for a political club and who would be excluded and who would be able to donate and how much you'd be able to donate and how do you funnel and create a, a fundraising plan. All of the machinations that go into a, a creating a body politic they didn't have them conversations in front of us. Why? We weren't supposed to know that information. 
We ain't supposed to be having this, these types of conversations that I believe Dr. Ball is talking about. Those are not the conversations that we should be looking to Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, either a white or black owned version of them to have. Social media is for us to socialize, for us to connect. It is not for the development of a revolutionary politic. It simply cannot be done in those spaces. So if you're your only source of connection to whomever is, is the, the leader of the day is through their Twitter feed, through their Facebook page. I would suggest that if that political leader or their YouTube also, channel or their, or their YouTube channel, if they are not also creating, uh, I hate to use the word cells, but, but small groups of people who are able to, on a local basis, sit in the same room or Zoom into the same space with the Zoom registration, you know, where you are able to verify who's there and who's not who have an agenda that is backed by an analysis framework, not just a, what I think and I feel and my emotions. No, what is your framework? Are you looking at a self-collective root responsibility framework, which happens to be the one that the group that I affiliate with, and that's something that can be publicly known? Or is it a whatever drives you at the moment, whatever gets your passion at the moment framework? That's not a framework. That's an emotion. We have to go back to having offline conversations via Zoom um, that are socially disappropriate. <laughs> But it, these are not things that you're going to find on social media. So the only place you're seeing this work happening is on a YouTube page. I would suggest that's great for intellectual masturbatory thought, but that's not going to lead no movement for revolution. I, I would also just want to add very quickly, you have to remember that, you know, to some of the points you've made, the, the, inter, the Internet and its origins is military technology. And at its highest stage of use, that's what it's there for. And the people that run it talk about it in, in terms of what they call full spectrum dominance. So we're able to do what we're doing and we have fun on, online or whatever. But like J. Lou once famously said, for my generation, the, 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 same nuclear, the same chip that powers nuclear bombs powers my Sega. And that's exactly what we're, we're dealing with now. Wow. Um, uh, and by the way, you know, you mentioned Russian bots and whatever. Uh, uh, what we really have to also become clear on is that, that, at least I would argue, the whole Russiagate thing is totally, I think, misunderstood. And if anybody is engaging in propaganda against us or, or American citizens at, at all, it's uh, the federal government the intelligence agencies who far outpace uh, uh, engagement with uh, social media. Operation Sock Puppet is one example uh, than, than certainly Russian bots. And even beyond that, the political campaigns of, of Hillary Clinton, Barack, uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and what we're going to see coming up uh, now, they spend way more on Facebook and, and Twitter ads than any Russian bot. So, so in other words, the propaganda that we're suffering isn't coming from Russia. The, it's coming know, from, the, from the originators it, of, of it's propaganda. Coming, it's, it's coming the originators of propaganda, which is America, by the way. Yep. In case you were wondering, it wasn't the Nazis. They got the Nuremberg laws from our Jim Crow laws. Oh, go figure. And all that eugenics conversations started here. 866-801-8255. All right. Reconstruction, which saw the election of a lot of black people, uh, was like a, a rug pull from under us, right? So, yeah, we participated when we could. Megar Evers lost his life trying to, you know, we've always wanted to participate. Uh, but I think what Laurie was talking about was more of a systemic head start in terms of how the system, like, had we known, okay, we got the right to vote, but then they're going to do all of these other shenanigans and start lynching us and threatening us to not, you know, participate. I think we would have probably done something to protect ourselves. I don't know. What would we have done? You can even think about it in terms of when we got when President Barack Obama was elected into office. Had we been aware of the deviousness of the nature of this political apparatus, we would have anticipated that Mitch McConnell and white Republicans would have been in a room on the night of the inauguration talking about we're going to make him a one term president. I don't care if he does want to advance policies that are in line with us. We are going to rebuke him at every single point. We're going to get back the House in the two years from now. We're going to make sure that we stack the courts with the judges that we want. We're going to deny him the ability to put anyone into the judiciary that would be able to benefit black people, we are going to cut him off at every single opportunity. Getting access, getting one foot in the door is a very different thing than understanding the blueprint of how the house was constructed. And we've always been able to have, you know, there's always been, ever since we've gotten off the plantation, yeah, we can run some people from office, yeah, but do we know how to organize a political club? And that can look at right now as communities that a lot of us live in that are being heavily gentrified. One thing that often happens when gentrifiers who are not black move into black communities is they'll come around with petitions to run for positions in the local leadership structures that have been absent or vacant for decades. Why? Because we didn't even know that a lot of those positions existed. Maybe I'm just talking to black New York City. I don't know, but I doubt it. So the reality is we can run for office. That's cool. That's
that's a popular position. It's an on front in front of the microphone position. It is not the same thing as knowing what the Democratic political club is responsible for in your area and how are they connected to electing the judges and determining who gets to be on a judiciary ballot, which is connected to who gets to be considered for a district attorney position. Those things we are often not as astute about because we are often focused on the preacher position, which is the person who gets to run for office and gets all the accolades and the public mic time. Okay. Um, I, I think I want to know, first of all, where are you from, Dr. Ball? Who's your I people? I was born in Washington, D.C., and I grew up for the most part where I live now in Columbia, Maryland, the, the Klan suburb. Okay. Talk about supposed utopians. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. We go. We gonna we gonna get to know you in the coming months and, and years okay. here on the Carrot at the Show because uh, sure. you're you're a keeper. But go ahead, Lori. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't believe. I, I want to say that, that uh, one of the complicating factors about the bus boycott is that. Part of the work that went into it was how are you going to ensure that the people who are now walking have enough shoes, right? This is one teeny tiny little aspect of it. So it, the political campaign wasn't just we're not going to get on the bus. It was also that we are going to supply the people who are now forced to walk with an alternative means of making sure they're able to get from A to B that that was basically you're going to walk your shoes down by walking 10 miles a day. So there were floods of people all across the community who would send in additional pairs of shoes so that people would have access to some sort of physical apparatus that would help them replace the apparatus that they were now leaving. As it pertains to whether or not we have enough money to sustain, I, that I do not know. What I do believe, however, a, a good uh, sister friend of mine who's an entrepreneur said if black people just had, if black owned businesses had black people buying from them, we would not need as much capital because we would have the capital we need in the form of customers. I know that there's been a lot of talk through uh, the, the, the sister who wrote the book, Our Black Year, where she talks about like her family's effort to try to buy black for an entire year. One of the things they talk about is that black people currently send, spend about two cents out of every dollar in a black owned business. If we were to elevate that two cents out of every dollar to approximately 10 cents out of every dollar, we literally have the capacity to ensure that every black owned business, which is really just a sole proprietorship, because as you said, most of us cannot afford to hire anybody else. If I die, my business dies with me. If we were to elevate our spending from two cents out of every dollar to 10 cents out of every dollar, we would literally empower those black businesses to hire an additional person, which would make a huge dent in our unemployment ranks. Now, do we have the capacity to only survive off of black owned businesses? A black on dollars? Maybe not, based on what the numbers that you were talking about say. But if we were able to expand and scale our programs up, we would not have to rely solely on black people because we would also be able to service additional. Same way the Chinese community doesn't only get their money from Chinese people. They set up Chinese food restaurants where mainly in our communities where they're able to sustain themselves off of our dollars. But, okay. What the, would you say is, to that? The, I, what I, first, what I would say is that we can't spend go from two to ten cents uh, spending on black businesses because there aren't enough black businesses that can satisfy our consumer needs on a national level. So we can't do All right. that. It All also right. No, 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 no. So you, you don't know that for a fact. That's not a fact. That's your supposition. No. It, there are black it, people that make it. toilet paper, washing paper. We just have to be more physically uh, ser searching and also and on this program, I, I always ask the question. Somebody called up yesterday, wanted to start a business uh, in entertainment. I'm like, what do we need? And if, if, if we can start businesses in the areas of need and we, with the intent that we can support them, I've watched, I've sat here for five years, I've watched so many tech businesses start from nothing and are very successful now because they figured it out with this audience. So I, I don't no, agree with they, you. No, that's not how they did it. They, they figured out how to get venture capitalist investment. No, that's not how they did no. it. No. Uh, there's a woman that has a there, there's a woman that didn't didn't get any VC money who who Ma, Black Mama T Vodka you, you, Miss Braxton who did it the way that I think we all can do it with with real estate and with building a business that is neat. right now she's doing hand sanitizer because she's one of the few FDA approved factories in the country Black owned who can who has the the the, the patent to be able to do that I just think we are not we're thinking too small and I think there's a lot of negativity especially in this commentary, no, see, and I get see, it. I think it's the opposite. The negativity, the, 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 the pessimism, and I borrow this from my brother Nathan Connolly at Johns Hopkins, the, the negativity or the pessimism 
is directed at the political system as opposed to the economic one. So I'm described as being a pessimist for saying we don't have any money just because we don't. Uh, but my optimism is in the political system. What I'm saying is get over the, the mythology that, 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 that you know, the, 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 the pessimism should be found in the economic world because there's so many things I, I disagree with. with, with, with to, to, to just because, it's the same thing with celebrity. Just because one person is able to start a business that becomes relatively successful should not be, said, be used to say that we all can. It should be used to say this is how capitalism works. There are certain bubbles and rooms for certain businesses. To, to, no, they're, they're systems, and, and we haven't been system other, builders. But the, so, but the other point that I didn't get to get to, to, uh, to the point when you were bringing up uh, um, uh, China and other communities, what we have to remember is, this is so important, the reason there are so many Chinese restaurants all over the country is because of a historical relationship between the governments of China and the United States. We're going back to the early 1900s. The government said the only way you can send Chinese people over here, because we don't want the yellow peril over here, is if they're coming mm. over here to set up businesses, and not just businesses that whatever you want, businesses that we find acceptable, meaning we, the white American government, finds acceptable. So you can do mm. some laundry mats and Chinese restaurants, because we don't, and, and you can sell us food that's not really Chinese food, because no Chinese person really eats that stuff that we get fed all the time. Right. That's not real Chinese food. And you can do right. so you can, but my point is this was a political relationship, not an okay. economic one. And that's why I keep saying we need to go back and address ourselves that way. That's where the hope is. I'm it's not discounting agent. that, but I always say two things can be true. And I know how to walk and chew gum. I know Lorene knows how to walk and chew gum. I'm just meeting you, Dr. Ball. I think you can walk and chew gum. <laughs> we can definitely put together the political system that we need, be political forward. We talk about this all the time from filling out the census to freaking voting with a purpose and vetting candidates. But we but also I, have to have. Can I go just, ahead. Can I, I'm going to follow the logical the conclusion of the example you brought up a moment ago about toilet paper. Because I've seen all of these products. There are black owned companies that, that will sell you all kinds of products. But if 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 what you're saying or calling for were to actually happen, what would those companies would immediately co uh, come into conflict with is that they wouldn't be able to expand fast enough to, to satisfy the consumer base if all of us actually started trying to That's go true. to them. They're not big enough. And you're they right. can't mm. get the loans from other major banks to that's where that's where the political right. part comes into this. So so that, that requires one of the, that requires one of those meetings that we need to have where we talk about what is the scalability, but what, how much do you need to scale up? And then the other part, the, the, the final part of the logic, the, I think the logic is to go back to what I'm saying about redistribution. At the end of the day, I still don't care if all of my businesses are satisfied by black people if those black people don't act differently than the white ones who currently own the apparatus that that's that. suffering under now. I so that's why I keep saying I don't really, I want to get to this we're all whatever the national pot is, whether it's the national in terms of America or national in terms of the black nation, whatever the national pot is that gets created, we're all participating in that creation. And I want us all to benefit from it, if not okay. exactly equally in a far more. Re so that's why I keep saying we need to. We, that's where we need to be focused. It Listen, shouldn't matter is, if, we, if we can duplicate what that sister did business wise. It shouldn't we, matter. What should we are we, we are start we are we are starting a conversation with you. I'm not 100 yeah. percent bought in. But I do, you know, no, for real. Listen, but this is part of, listen, this is, this is important though. We need to have these conversations. We need to have them. I'm going to read your whole book. You know, we're going to get through it. I'm reading Mercer's. I'm in the middle of hers and we're going to keep having these conversations. I've had to rethink what I think about banks. This is part of the discourse that we need to have so that we can arrive at. Absolutely. Listen, we got, we got one destination. There may be several roads to get there, but we got one destination. As long as we're clear about that, we're family, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely.